Welcome, everybody. Feel free to share uh, where you're coming in from in the chat box if you'd like while folks are arriving. Great. Lots of Michigan and Illinois, a Maine, Ohio. Is that oh, South Dakota, Ontario? Excellent. Lots of locals too. few uh, Florida residents. <laughs> Monarch Way Station number 17. This is definitely one fun thing about doing webinars is having participants from all over the place. I think I saw um, somebody in from Canada here too. That's nice. New Jersey. Oh yeah, Burlington, Ontario, Canada. I saw another two. International. Yeah, I saw Winnipeg. All right, in the interest of, oops. My my PowerPoint has a mind of its own. There we go. In the interest of uh, just keeping on time, let's get started. And I'm sure more people will continue to come in. We had um, about 490 RSVPs. So um, we'll see how many people are able to actually be here with us. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, to Growing Native Plants for Butterflies and Moths in the Garden. And this program is presented by the Washtenaw County Conservation District, and we are based here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And this is also in partnership with the Washtenaw County Water Resources Commissioner's Office. And for those of you who are not familiar, the Washtenaw County Conservation District has been assisting residents with the conservation and management of uh, and wise use of natural resources since 1948. And we primarily serve residents through uh, education, like programs like this, resources, and also technical assistance. So this program is part of our conservation education series. So with that, I'd like to introduce one of our partners, uh, Lisa Dennis, and she's with the Water Resources Commissioner's Office Rain Garden Program. And Lisa, if you'd like to say a little bit more about your background and what you do. Hi, I'm uh, Lisa Dennis, and like Megan said, I'm with the Washtenaw County Water Resources Program, and I'm assisting with their Rain Garden Program. Um, so helping residents and um, create rain gardens to improve our water quality, and then also um, help and maintain the public rain gardens that often take water in off of the street so it can be clean before it's heading out to our waterways. Thank you. 
Thanks for being here, Lisa. And before um, introducing Brenda, I just want to give a couple housekeeping notes. If you haven't noticed already, all attendees are not visible uh, and you're also muted, but you can uh, ask questions in the Q&A box, which Lisa will be monitoring. And uh, we will also be monitoring the chat box as well, where folks are posting where they're uh, zooming in from. Uh, so we'll hold most of the questions till the end, but uh, we'll kind of keep track of, of what questions are coming up and if it seems appropriate uh, at the time, we can briefly interrupt Brenda uh, and ask her some questions. And I did wanna also mention that we are going to enter everyone who is, is attending virtually tonight into a, a door prize drawing for Brenda's book. So uh, I will announce the winner after the session in an email you'll receive tomorrow, a follow-up of uh, this event. You'll receive an email, it'll list the person who won and I'll also post that on our Facebook. And we will also post the uh, live video, I'm sorry, the recording of the live video on our YouTube channel so you can view that later. Okay. And last plug for the Washtenaw County Conservation District. We have a lot of great things going on. If you're here in Washtenaw County, please visit our website. Uh, we'll plug a couple times. We've got the uh, second annual Native Plant Expo and Marketplace coming up on June 5th at the Farm Council Grounds. And you can pre-order native plants to pick up on that day. And that uh, pre-ordering is happening now through, I believe, April 31st. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, Brenda Diedzik, who is an author of Raising Butterflies in the Garden. And I'm going to let Brenda also introduce more details about her uh, adventures with butterflies and moths and uh, more details about what she does. So I'll stop my presentation here, Brenda, if you wanna take over. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Brenda Dizek, and I've been studying butterflies and moths for about 21 years. Uh, I've, done, I've done research um, throughout several states in the United States, and I also did some research with the University of Florida in Ecuador. Uh, I love learning. Um, I've sp sp spoke at many, you know, in Texas and in Florida and Ohio and Michigan and I've done quite a few Zooms um, since COVID. I've spoke at schools and been at different events. Uh, you know, I co-founded the Southeast Michigan Butterfly Association and I'm the president. We're a 501c3. Um, so we teach people about butterflies and moths. Uh, I've, you know, a master gardener um, with a little over 7,000 volunteer hours. Um, you know, I've, I've gotten, I've been on TV, quite a few different TV programs. Um, you know, I, I just, I just love sharing information with people. Um, I've got, you know, letters from may, my mayor and from uh, senators and from a representative of uh, John Connors when he was a, a one of our congressmen. Um, you know, so I just like that people know that I do this because it's just, I love doing garden walks too, so I can show people what plants they can plant to attract what species. So it's just really important to me that people learn about these things because so many people will see an insect chewing on their plants and they want to kill it. And they have no clue if it, you know, most insects are beneficial insects, but they, if they learn what their, what each insect is, um, how it helps our ecosystem is just so important. So I just love sharing all the information that, you know, I have with everyone just to try to help help our place be a little bit better. So um, today I'm gonna to be giving a talk on 
native uh, plants for butterflies and moths. So I'll go ahead and get my program up here. Okay, let's see. And I don't know why I can't see. Hmm. If you um, if you go to slideshow on the top. Oh, I see. I, I no, I, I no, I had I know how to do it. I have oh. to move this. This thing was up in oh covering it. So okay, there we go. Okay, here we go. So I hope this isn't in everybody else's view. Okay, so we're gonna cover the different plants and a little bit of information about these species also. So first of all, if you're gonna plant for butterflies and moths, you need to know what butterflies or moths are in your area. So you can ask, you know, people, uh, you can ask people like me, um, you can check with different Facebook groups or tons of groups that can help you. Um, one of mine is learn about butterflies in the garden, but I also have um, several others, um, you know, the Southeast Michigan Butterfly Association, and you can also check with your local DNR. You can go to this website butterfliesandmoths.org and when you go there you're going to click on regional checklist when you do you can select any and that would give you butterflies and moths or you can check butterflies or just moths then you'll pick what region you're in what state and what county and you hit apply and when you do you'll get this long list you'll get the latin name and the common name if you click on the blue the latin name it will give you information about that species it will tell you host plants um when it flies you know um it will just give you show you pictures of it so that way you'll know what plants to plant for that species This is what my yard used to look like back in 2000 when I got married. And as you can see, occasionally a cabbage white would flutter through. Well, that's when I got married in 2000 and, and we just couldn't have a backyard like that, not with me living there. So, well, this is what it looks like now. So yes, um, we just had to remove all the silliness and, and plant things that would be beneficial to all the insects. I ran out of room in the backyard. So, well, as you can see, these old ugly shrubs that everybody used to plant in their yard, which don't do anything. And look at all this grass. All that grass does is, you know, a, attract Japanese beetles. And I mean, who wants them? Um, you know, so, I just had to do something with that. That was quite a mess. So this is my front yard now. Um, you know, I just keep adding and adding different plants all the time to it that will beneficial, you know, be beneficial to the species in the area. So we'll go ahead and talk about, you know, creating the habitats. The majority of your plant or your of the plants that you need for the butterflies and moths, they need full sun. So um, you know, try to find a spot that does have at least six hours of sun. And you, when you're first planting them, of course, you're going to water them every day until the roots are established. But most of my plants that I have are native, and once they're they're established, I never water, and they just do just fine. So you're gonna save money. And plus, 
when you plant the native plants, it's going to attract beneficial insects. So they're going to get rid of the bad ones for you. So people are putting all these pesticides on things. You won't have to worry about any of that. You're going to save money on chemicals. You're going to save money on water. So why not use native plants? Yes, and I know probably a lot of you have seen this picture, but it's, it's so true that the native plants, you know, they enrich the soil and filter the groundwater and they provide lots of um, habitat for, you know, different wildlife. And also, like I mentioned, they come back strong after a drought. So just because I love doing photography and I love seeing if a butterfly is laying eggs on plants, I try to get you know my bigger plants in the back and smaller in the front. That way I can see what's going on. And if I see a butterfly out there laying eggs, boy, I'm out there running and collecting those eggs right now, or maybe I want to get a picture of that species. So I like to have the majority of my taller plants in the back. And it's really important to plant them in groups because butterflies are nearsighted and, you know, and moths. And so, um, you know, unless you're planting bushes or trees or something, you want to try to have a group of plants. Um, it's easier for them to see. And also, if it's a host plant and you only planted like one little plant, like you, you just got one new Baptise tinctoria and, a, you know, wild indigo dusky wing comes and lays an egg on it well if it's a small little plant there's not going to be enough food for that caterpillar to complete its metamorphosis so you know it that will ensure that the caterpillars have enough food to survive you also want to plant in multiple locations um this will prevent as much predation um because if a predator you have your plant in one area and the predator sees there's caterpillars on that plant it can wipe out that whole plant but if you have your host this you know the same kind of a host plant in several different locations it's less chance of predation of all this um you know the eggs and caterpillars that were laid if you can provide shelter from wind you will see you know probably a few more butterflies. I know the lady that got me started years ago, she had all the same plants that I have, but hers was just a wide open space. Um, and because I live in a tiny place, I have you know privacy fences all around and I'd see so many more. Um, but if you, know, if you don't have privacy fences, you can also provide some breakage of the wind with you know trellises and fences and tall plants. And butterflies are cold-blooded insects, and so are moths. <laughs> and so they have to heat up their wing muscles in order to fly. So, you know, rocks and can provide, they absorb the heat and when they're on it, they can heat up their wing muscles in order to fly when it's cool outside. So here we have a painted lady sunning itself on Mr. Toad. And we have a monarch sunning itself on the Monarch Way Station. And I was actually the first Monarch Way Station in Michigan and number 45 in the United States. Oh, and, and besides one other thing I forgot that I am, um, besides kind of silly, um, I'm, I'm also one of the Monarch Watch conservation specialists for Monarch Watch. I like to keep overripe fruit out for butterflies and moths because you know, it provides nutrients and there's many different species that love to feed on overripe fruit. So my favorite is the watermelon. It's so darn cheap. You can buy a big old watermelon. You cut off a hunk, stick it out there till it gets really, really gross and stinky. And they don't care. They like the stinky. But when it gets really gross and slimy, then I throw that in the garbage and it, I can probably keep a piece out for like a whole week, then I chop off another hunk. And, and so um, I do that. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, one of my favorites is a banana. And um, so I leave this skin on. 
Um, if you took the skin off, it would dry out really fast. And then I just make a little slit with my fingernail along the side just so um, juice will come out. And you can see I have a question mark and that's the name of this butterfly. And I have a red admiral on the banana here. Over here, this is a viceroy and it's, I took a suet box and I stuck a piece of watermelon in it. And the viceroy is, you know, feeding on, on the um, watermelon. But that banana, doing it that way, leaving the skin on, just making a little slit, it might last like close to a week before I have to throw another banana in. So that's a real cheap way to feed them too. Not that you have to be cheap, but you know. <laughs> so this is when I used to use other things. This was cantaloupe and, you know, um, I used to peel the banana so it wouldn't stay fresh very long, but you can see we have Vanessa's um, Sphinx on the, uh, you know, on the watermelon and the morning cloak and the red spot of purple, the red admiral and the um, question mark here. And these are just a few of the fruit um, loving butterflies and moths. Butterflies and moths, they ingest sodium and potassium out of, you know, damp sand and mulch and things. And those minerals are vital for reproduction. And also the water converts the fats to sugar, which helps fuel them in their flights. And here we have a few species puddling. So, um, you know, this spice bush swallowtail is getting minerals here. And this is a painted lady, a juvenile's dusky wing. And over in the left corner is a silver spotted skipper. We're gonna cover a few nectar plants. Um, you know, that's food for the butterflies and moths. And also, the nectar contains carbohydrates and amino acids, and those are needed for egg production. So here we have orange coneflower and wild bergamot and prairie phlox. We have Canada goldenrod, and we have common milkweed and New England aster. Black Eyed Susan, Swamp Milkweed, Blue Mist Flower, and Butterfly Weed. Wild Geranium and Pink Swamp milk or Pink sw Swamp Milkweed and San Coreopsis. Wild Sweet William, Joe Pie Weed, and ironweed. This is what I feel is the most important because if you just have nectar plants in your yard, a butterfly is going to fly there, take a drink, go, well, I can't complete my metamorphosis here. I better find a place where we can lay eggs, we, you know, we can find a mate, we can mate, um, we can lay eggs, and the whole life cycle can happen. So I really feel host plants are so important. So we'll cover some of the host plants. I keep trees in my yard, and these are some of the trees that I have. And probably most of you know, a tulip poplar tree gets like 80 to 100 feet tall. Well, I can't have that in my yard because then I'd if I had let all these trees grow to full size, I'd have a shade garden. I don't want a shade garden. So each fall, I stump cut my trees to between two and three feet tall to keep them Brenda size. That way I can find all the eggs and caterpillars on them. I'll still have to get the step ladder for my a tulip poplar, poplar tree each year because it just grows so fast. But at least with a step ladder, I can still find the caterpillars. So yeah, I have you know the tulip poplar, the wild black cherry, uh, the chinkapin oak, hop tree, and arrowwood viburnum. Um, I also have some other ones too. They're just not in the picture. So, you know, um, I do, I don't know why, because I've, most of these plants, I've already got them in the ground. 
but I go ahead and plant plants in pots too. I just like to have a lot of the host plants all over the place. And plus it puts them in multiple locations, you know, to prevent the predation of, you know, from predators. So this is what I do with my trees um, in the winter. I take them, you know, um, with my dolly and I move them all to the back of my house. And then I take leaves and pack leaves, or you can use mulch, but I just use leaves. There's a ton of leaves everywhere. And I pack them on top and in between all the pots and, you know, um, to help insulate the roots. And my pots are not real chintzy ones, so they're a little bit thicker. And that way it helps insulate the roots. And still when it snows or getting moisture, you know, if it's raining, they are. And then, you know, um, once we're, we're all done with snow, then I'll move them back along the, my driveway because I have no more room in the yard for these. So they go along my driveway and, and I'll have my plants. But this is what I do with all my trees. Um, also, um, sometimes, like I had a, um, uh, a black willow and it started really doing really bad because it was root bound. So what I do when the, you know, and I can, I can trim the trees while, you know, they're in the pots, but when it starts not to do so well, I lay the pot over, pull the tree out, chop off at least one third of the roots, remove the soil, loosen the roots, and then I repot it and it just does wonderful then. So um, that's what I do when they start not doing quite it so well. So um, in these pictures, this year, I, I, this was about two feet, um, which was fine. Um, but this year I did them about three feet because I want leaves a little bit sooner. Um, you know, I still got my leaves and, you know, like I said, the tulip poplar tree, you know, still went to so high I had to get the stepladder, but, um, and so did my cheek pin. Oh, that thing grows like crazy too. Um, but I did mine about three feet this year, just because I want leaves a little bit sooner for the species that are coming and laying eggs. So we're gonna talk about some of the species we can create habitat for right now. So first we'll talk about the monarch. And this is what a monarch egg looks like. And a lot of times early in the season, people will say, oh, I seen a monarch in my yard, but it's just not laying eggs. And a lot of your information will say, oh, they lay underneath the leaf. Well, let me tell you, they lay under the leaf, they lay on top of the leaf, they lay on the stem. And early in the season, when the buds are tight, they lay on the buds. So, that's a place to check when they're before the buds start opening they'll lay on the buds so monarchs lay eggs in the exclepius family that's the milkweed family that's the only um you know thing that they will lay their eggs on and their caterpillars will feed on and you can see when they you know first come out they're very small and this is when it gets full grown now all caterpillars they have exoskeletons and they can only get so big in that skin and so they shed their you know, their face i call it a face mask but it's their head capsule and then they shed their skin so that the body underneath of it you know, can expand to the next size. And they do this five times. And when the caterpillar is full grown, like this one here, already underneath that skin are the butterfly's wings, it's proboscis, you know, it's antenna. A lot of the body of the butterflies already formed underneath that skin. And, you know, of course, after it sheds its skin, you know, it will, then some of it has to rearrange. It would develop reproductive system and it won't have the pro legs anymore. But um, a, a lot of people think, oh, it just liquefies. Well, no, part of that butterfly is already formed underneath that skin. And this is butterfly weed. This is one of the host plants. 
This is common milkweed. And I used to have it along my garage and I had it in these buckets because common milkweed does have underground um, you know, rhizomes and they'll just pop up all over. And I wanted, I had it all here because I just wanted them to lay the eggs and me to have um, food um, for them to feed. And I didn't want it going everywhere because um, my yard is so tiny. Um, if you have if you have this space or you don't mind it taken over, it is excellent because look at the size of these leaves. It's a lot of food for those caterpillars to eat. This here is my poke milkweed. And this does well in shade. So this is one of your shade plants. Also, swamp milkweed, what a terrible name. You don't have to have it in wet. I have it in full sun and in a dry area. So you can have it in wet, you can have it in shade, you can have it in full sun and dry. It is so versatile. So um, this, I have a, a lot of this in my backyard in the full sun. This here's the summer azure. And here's its little egg. And these are plants that they lay their eggs on. And you can see the ants are all over the caterpillar. These caterpillars produce honeydew. And the caterpillars eat the honeydew. And in return, they protect that caterpillar from predators. So even when I was trying to take a picture of this, they seen me. And so they started hurry, hurting it all the way down to the soil to protect it from me because I was there getting close to it to take a picture. But they protect it from predators. And this is my New Jersey tea. This is a black swallowtail. And the eggs of swallowtails are perfectly round and you'll see the black swallowtail is a pale yellow. And it's different in stars, it, it looks different and you can even have different colors when it gets bigger like um, this dark black and um, you know, so they, this one here, it had just shed its skin, this is its skin behind it. And, it lost its head capsule. And when it first does, it's real pale and then it will darken up. So they'll lay their eggs on golden Alexanders. And here's golden Alexanders. This is the American lady. And these are the eggs and you know what these are really really small um when i started doing this 21 years ago i could go out and i didn't even wear glasses then and you know i could go out and i could find those and they're like 1 64th of an inch and i could find them on the plants well then those goofy butterflies started laying them and making them smaller i think because then i had to wear my glasses my bifocals well that wasn't good enough then they, I, I think they started even laying them even smaller because not only did I have to use my bifocals, but I had to use a magnifying glass too. Oh, those silly little things. And, and when they do, it looks like they're buried like under like, um, it's pieces of the leaf, but it kind of looks hairy. So it makes it really difficult to find. So here's um, you know, some of the things that they lay their eggs on. And you can see that they can look different too. What they do until they get really, really big is all caterpillars have a spinner rep that produces silk. So they'll stitch together. See the silken mess right here? They stitch together the leaves and they hide inside to try to protect themselves from predators. However, sometimes a wasp will rip that open and grab it out and eat it, but they do this to try to protect themselves, and they'll eat the, you know, inside the leaf. And then when it's the exoskeleton of a leaf, they'll go to other ones and stitch them together. So if you see a silken mess, you know, on your pussy toes, you'll know that there's probably a caterpillar inside of that. 
This is my Pearly Everlasting. And here's Pussy Toes. This is a giant swallowtail. And you know, it's, it's a swallowtail. So again, the egg is perfectly round. It's about 1 32nd of an inch. And well, actually it's just a tad bigger than that. Um, and it, it's like an orangish or a tannish color. Um, you know, sometimes it isn't quite this orangish. It can be more tannish. Uh, this might have just been the lighting when I took the picture. And this caterpillar looks like bird dropping. So that's its protection from predators. Because when a bird sees it, it's like, oh, I need that. Yeah. You know, and so some of the things that they lay their eggs on are hop tree and prickly ash. This is hop tree. And prickly ash. And I just bought this last year. No, it wasn't last year. Wild type, I couldn't go to the wild type because of COVID. So it must have been the year before. And so it wasn't very big. And boy, I got all sorts of eggs off of that. This is a pearl crescent with a little striped antenna. Look at there, all black and white stripes, so darn cute. And they lay a cluster of eggs. So these are some pictures of the caterpillar. And they lay only on asters. This is what I actually raised mine on was a heart leafed aster. But like I said, they lay on all asters. This is sky blue aster. Smooth aster. And calico aster. This is a pipeline swallowtail. And it also lays a cluster of eggs. And when they lay on Virginia snake root, I know in Michigan, um, that's a protected plant. Um, one of my friends, and she could be on here now, one time showed me where some was because she knew that I would like to see it, you know, even though I already had mine in my own yard. But unfortunately, I bought mine from Nebraska because this is, you know, in Michigan, it's protected. But, um, when these guys are little, they feed communally. And then when they get larger, then they'll you know, be a solitaire um, feeder. This is a morning cloak, and this is one of our longest living butterflies. It can live, live up to 12 months. And in the winter, it overwinters as a butterfly in crevices of trees or wood piles, um, you know, and they lay in clusters too. And when they first lay them, they're this creamy color. And as they're developing, they'll turn red. And right before they come out, they turn black. And that's because that's the color of the butterfly or the caterpillar underneath there. So these are the caterpillars. And let me tell you, these guys I think have ADD because they would not stop for a minute. So that's when I, pictures are a little bit blurry because they are continually moving around. I don't even know how they can even possibly eat. They're moving so much. But here's some of the things that they lay their eggs on. So, you know, birch and elm, hatbury and willow. Well, my hatbury used to be in a pot, but now I've got it planted in the ground. But um, I forgot to take a picture of it. So you get one of, of it when it was in the pot. And thank goodness, I was raising all sorts of IOs this month or this month, last year, and they did awesome. I was try, I tried them on several different plants that they feed on, and they grew the fastest and biggest on the hackberry. 
So yeah, it's it's a host plant for quite a few species, but I had so much fun with my IOs and I got stung a whole bunch of times because I knew that if my hand touched them, it, it would. So I'd just take my teeth and scratch where they got me and get the little barbs out and it would quit itching. But um, my husband says, why don't you just take the plants out and see reach them behind them? I says, well, what fun would that be? There'd be no challenge. Um, you know, so, you know, oh, well. And this is pussy toes. This here is a question mark. And you can tell this from the Eastern comma because the Eastern comma will have these three um, circular dots here, but the question mark will have this rectangular mark above here. Plus on the underside of the hind wing, the question mark will have a question mark, um, you know, so it's not a sign, but a mark. <laughs> and the um, comma will just have the comma. So they, their lay eggs are really little and they either will lay them single or they will stack them. I've had stacks as big as five or six stacks before. And here's what these caterpillars look like. And they can vary in color, but when they're little, you know, they look like this, um, they're black with the little, oh, yellowish, orangey little um, tubercles on here. And as they get bigger, you know, they can look, be, they can vary in color. And here's some of the things that they lay their eggs on. So this is my common hops. And you know what? One thing about these goofy butterflies, they are goofy. Um, Hops grows from the bottom each year. All this dies. Well, the butterfly will come and it'll lay an egg up here on the wood when the plant's way down here. Or one time I had a pussy willow in a pot over here and that's not its host plant. And it laid an egg on the, on the pussy willow over here. I had a dead leaf on the ground down here on the driveway and it laid an egg there. And it's like, how are these guys ever really supposed to find this host plant? I mean, they're, they're, they're not a very good mama. Anyways, um, and they will lay on um, false nettle and on, on hackberry and on stinging nettle. And I keep a pot of stinging nettle in the back um, because false nettle doesn't come up nearly as soon as the stinging nettle and question marks and eastern commas over winter as adults also in wood piles and crevices of trees. So they break dipause and come out of hibernation sooner. And also the red admirals are, they've already started migrating up here. My daughter lives in Texas and she's seen one last week. So they're starting their migration up here. And um. If I didn't have stinging nettle, when the question mark came out of dipause, it would have no place to lay eggs because the false nettle isn't up yet. So I keep the stinging nettle in a pot just so I can keep an eye on it because it really does sting. This is the red spotted purple. And here's the eggs of the, or the egg of the red spotted purple. And they will always lay right on the tip of the leaf. And if you see um, just a mid vein with the leaf gone on both sides and just the mid vein, you'll, that's what they do. They eat along the mid vein. And so you'll just see a mid vein there and you'll know there's been a caterpillar there or there still is one. And here's some things that they lay their eggs on. And this is what the caterpillar looks like. And it also looks like bird droppings. So that's its defense from predators. So here's black cherry. And cottonwood. and willow. This is a spice bush swallowtail. 
and its egg is white. And this caterpillar here is probably, well, there's really a lot of really cool, cool, cool looking moth caterpillars, but of butterfly caterpillars, this has got to be one of the cutest caterpillars you ever have seen. Isn't it just adorable? I mean, what, what person wouldn't just love it? Um, you know, and actually these are fake eye spots and they, they fool the birds. The birds will look at this and go, oh, it's a tree snake. I'm not going to eat that. So that's its defense from predators. But when it's first born, it looks like this. And you can see its first meal. And a lot of them will eat their eggshell. And that's their first meal. And then it's brown. And then it turns green. And right before it sheds its skin to reveal the chrysalis, it turns either a yellow or a yellowish orangish color. So it lays its eggs on sassafras and spice bush. This is sassafras. And here's spice bush. This is a wild indigo dusky wing. And here's its egg. And it lays eggs on wild indigo and wild lupin. And this is what the um, caterpillar looks like. So this is my Baptisia tinct, my wild um, yellow indigo. So Baptisia tinctoria, I'm just so used to calling it that. And this is my wild lupin. This is the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. And its egg is a greenish color, a light green. And here's the caterpillar. When it's first born, it looks like this. Then it's green and right before it makes its chrysalis, it turns this brownish purplish color and it lays eggs on cherry and tulip tree. So again, this is my cherry tree and my tulip poplar. See, look at how big that gets after I chop it down to like that year was only two feet. Them things really grow a lot. And it, my oak trees over here and that thing goes like crazy too. This is the red admiral. And this is a red admiral egg. And here's the caterpillar, and here's some things that they lay their eggs on. So again, we have false nettle and stinging nettle. This is a hummingbird clear wing. And the eggs are green. And it lays on viburnum. There's a lot of, um, I'm going to do research on this this year because a lot of your books will say they also lay on honeysuckle and, and snowberry. But I really think people have just copied that from other writers because there's a snowberry clearwing that looks almost identical. It just has different color legs um, and the wings are a little marking is a little bit different. And they're the ones that use the honeysuckle and the snowberry. So I'm going to sacrifice some of my hummingbird clear wings this year. I have this snowberry, I have the you know native honeysuckle and I'm just going to do research and check this out myself because I really think they just got the two species confused. But I do know for sure they use viburnum. And this is arrowwood viburnum. This is a polyphemus and look at, he has a wingspan or 
actually that's a female. Um, it's got really skinny antenna. So she has a wingspan of about six inches. And this are what the polyphemus eggs look like. And here's the caterpillars. And here's some of the things that they lay their eggs on. I hope y'all are taking notes and going to be buying these plants to put in your yard this year. I know I've already got me a new list because I had a junk tree taken out of the front yard. So I've got three trees I'm buying that will be new trees to put in the front yard along my boulevard and um, keep them stump cut. But um, yeah, it's always fun putting new plants in to attract more species. So this is my oak. Now I'm gonna get a burr oak to put out front. And this is my prairie willow, which prairie willows are great for little yards because they don't get very big and they don't go into your water table. And so they work wonderful. This is a Cecropia, and this one is a boy. See how wide his antennas are? And that's because butterflies and moths smell with their antenna. So when the female emits her pheromones from miles away, he can smell where she is with his antenna and come and pair with her. These are Cecropia eggs. And these are some of the plants that they lay eggs on. And here's the different instars. So they start, you know, out black, excuse me, then they're like this. And then they start getting cute little tubercles on them, the orange and yellow. And then they even change cuter. Now they've got turquoise. And then this one's finally in my hand and, and that one's ready to spin its cocoon, which butterflies make a, a either, um, they'll uh, skipper, you can call it a pupa or a chrysalis, but moths will either have a naked pupa or they'll spin silk around them, which is a cocoon. And then the naked, they'll shed their skin inside of that cocoon and there'll be the pupa inside of it. But you never call a, a butterfly's a cocoon because it isn't, it isn't spinning silk around itself. It's always a chrysalis or you can say pupa. So here's, you know, one of the things that sucropulates on is the cherry and dogwood and willow. And this is a luna moth. And these are the eggs of the luna. And here's the caterpillars. And here's some things that they lay their eggs on. So this is sweet gum. And black walnut. This is the Promethea. And uh, the boy, he's dark, like a real dark brown. And this is a female. Um, and so, you know, she's much lighter in color. And look at how fat she is. She's full of eggs. And these are the eggs of the Promethea. And these are some things they lay their eggs on. And they will eat communally when they're little. And this is when they first come out and then they change to this color. Then when they get larger, then they'll feed, you know, they'll be solitary uh, feeders, but they, they stay together for quite a while and eat communally. So again, you know, I find eggs on, on my spice bush and on my tulip tree. Oh, this one here, look at it on my thumb, isn't it? How, it's so little, it's so darn cute. I just love the rosy maple. It's, it's just with the pink and yellow. I just think it's adorable. And 
these eggs, you can actually watch the development of the caterpillar inside of it. You can barely see its little head forming there in its body. And as it gets bigger, um, you can really see its head right before it comes out. And then when it comes out, you know, there's this little dark head and it looks like this at first and then it will change and change. And here's things that it eats, its, that it lays its eggs on. So it lays eggs on silver maple and on sugar maple. And here's a few places you can buy native plants and seeds. So I have wild type native plant nursery, the native plant nursery in Ann Arbor. Barson's Greenhouse are selling a lot of native plants. They have been for a few years. Hidden Savannah Nursery in Kalamazoo and the Wildflower, uh, Michigan Wildflower Farm. So these are some places you can get native plants and seeds from. So we can all help, you know, the butterflies and moths. All we need to do is start by planting one plant. And if you want more information on, you know, where, you know, on the host plants, it can be found in my book, Raising Butterflies um, in the Garden, or on butterfliesandmoths.org, and also on bugguide.net. Now, um, she had mentioned they're going to have um, the plant cell um, in Ann Arbor on June 5th, and I will be there. So if anybody purchased my book um, you know, beforehand, if you come out there, I will be happy to autograph it for you. So I, I will be at their event June 5th. So that's all I have. Um, so I'll be happy if anybody had any questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Wonderful, thank you, Brenda. I You're learned welcome. so much. Um, I almost interrupted you because I got really excited. Uh, I found, a, I think, the Promethea, mm -hmm. which it kind of scared me because I had no idea what it was. It was so large and furry, but it was so beautiful too. <laughs> But uh, I found one and I, as you were presenting, I realized there's a gigantic wild cherry tree in, next to my hoop house. So um, probably came from there, but uh, that's fascinating. Thank you. Um, You're good. <laughs> Lisa, do you uh, wanna try to open up some of these questions? Just ask them uh, to Brenda. Sure, yeah. So lots of different questions here. Um, so we'll try to get through them quickly. Um, so one of the first questions that came out, aphids from Becky, aphids are a problem on her milkweed. She said that water rinsing isn't helps, doesn't seem to help her. Um, and she's tried mixing in marigolds. What, what, what do you recommend? Well, the, um, oleander aphid, it has a piercing mouth part. And so if you do take the hose and spray them off, they bust off their mouth part and it causes them to die. But you have to keep doing that because there's gonna be eggs down in your mulch or um, you know, your soil that are gonna keep hatching. So once you bust off those, these other are going to, you know, they're down there. So you have to be persistent. And you know, after some time, finally after all these hatching up there and, and you've, continually sprayed that plant, you'll have no more of them. But it's something you have to be persistent at. Okay, yeah, and I, I seem to find rubbing a little bit with my finger and also that helps me to be very precise to make sure I don't mess up any eggs. So yeah, I've to... gone around squashing myself and end up with a yellow hand, but. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, several people have trouble with deer in their yard. So they've asked, are there different types of plants that you use? Is there anything short of putting up a tall fence to keep the deer out? I fortunately do not have to deal with that issue. Um, 
I have heard from people that if you buy liquid fence and spray it around the perimeter of your garden, that that will keep some species out. Um, you know, I wouldn't spray it on your plants, but they do it around the perimeter of the garden. So um, that would be worth a try. I, because I, you know, where I live and I have the privacy fence and I just have a tiny little yard, um, I don't have to deal with that issue. I'm so sorry, I don't have the answer for that. I would say um, I can include a link in the email follow-up with um, native plants that are uh, deer resistant to some degree. And you can kind of cross-reference if you have a couple options of host plants, you can see, you know, if there's some that tend to be deer resistant, you could choose that maybe over something that's not on the list. So I'll make sure to send that. Yeah, I think that the deer are more of a problem when trees and shrubs are young. So for your, at least for your trees and shrubs, maybe keeping them protected with a fence, um, you know, until they get a little more mature. And then I believe Megan, um, don't you, are you selling some of the, uh, that fence? Yeah. Uh, we, we have plant skid, it's, a, it's actually deer blood, um, but I would say actually the physical barrier is more effective long-term. I think the plant skid can be effective if you have a, kind of a minor problem. It can be a, a light deterrent, but the physical barrier is really gonna keep them off until the tree gets established. Although if you're stump cutting it, you might wanna keep some kind of cage around it so that they don't take those nice yeah. shoots every spring. A physical barrier helps because you know you got to be cautious about putting stuff on the plants when you have want caterpillars eat them. Okay Brenda next question. So somebody has a ugly wire fence. This is uh, Brittany and she has an ugly wire fence and she wants to know wants to know what type of vine you recommend that will attract or feed butterflies. Well, um, there's the native honeysuckle. Um, that's for the snowberry clearwing. Uh, so you can always use that. Um, let's see. On there, I don't know if that, I know there is a native wisteria, but I don't know if it's native to this area, but there is a native wisteria. Um, cause I put it in the butterfly house that I, I created, um, at Barson's. Um, there is a native wisteria and I believe okay. what's that? The silver spotted skipper. Right. Yes. And then, okay. What about your astrologia? Is that, what's the name of that? Uh, oh, well, the aristologia, um, but, um, okay. On the USDA website, Aristolochia macrophylla shows native here, but if you go to the website for uh, University of Michigan, it shows introduced. So um, many of your native plant people use that as a Bible, the um, University of Michigan one. And so, um, yep. And so um, that one shows introduced um, because at the time I was using USDA. And so I collected the seeds and I gave them to uh, Bill Schneider of Wild Type Nursery. I said, oh, here you can plant these. And so he propagated them. He got them looking beautiful. And I came um, on one of his cell days and he says, Brenda, you can take all these with you. And I'm going, <laughs> why don't you want to sell them? He says, no, nope. um, I looked it up under you know, the um, University of Michigan one, and they're introduced, so I'm not selling them. I'm going, oh, okay. <laughs> we, so. Something to bear in mind um, for everyone that's watching this is these are plants that are, um, you know, generally native to southeastern Michigan. If you're in another state, you would need to check your what's native in your area. So you might have some more options. Um, or some of these options that were mentioned might not work, you know, might might not be native for you. And then different, uh, but you know, Brenda, you know, if you want to elaborate on that, sometimes you have the same butterfly, but in different area, different regions, they eat different different host plants. 
And that's why if you use that website, butterfliesandmoths.org, and you put in where you're at, um, you know, and all the information, and it will show what butterflies are in your species or in your area. And then you can, well, I guess that's going to, that will give a, um, but if you're in an area where that species is and say it isn't here, you're going to get different information on that anyhow. But they can look up maybe what's local, at least yeah. to them. What plants are local? So look up the butterfly, what do they eat? And then right. what native plants are in your area? And that's probably what they're eating. Um, so we'll move on to another question from Terry Weston. Um, she plans to create a butterfly garden this year with native plants. What is the best way to prepare the land for the native plants? Well, what I did, and I actually did it like in the fall, I laid down like it was either eight or 10 um, layers of newspaper and overlapped it. And so all the ugly grass that was there all decomposed and enriched my soil. And, and I didn't have to dig up anything. I just planted. Um, you know, I hate to remove all the microorganisms and everything that's in soil by when you, you dig it up. But I mean, if you don't have time to do that, I, I guess, you know, like when I built the butterfly house, so I didn't wait a long time on that because I wanted to open it up that year. And I started, I can't remember if it was in January or February, I started building that butterfly house. And I laid down newspaper then and I wanted to open it up in June. So what I did is I just took a shovel and I made an X. I lift up the corners. I dug out that grass in that area. I planted the plants and then I put the paper back down around it with lots of mulch on top. And I never had a weed in there while, while, you know, while I owned the butterfly house. So um, that's also an option. I would suggest too, uh, we just had uh, Vern Stevens from Designs by Nature uh, last month, and he covered a lot of that in detail on how to prep areas for native plants. Um, so he, he provides some other options too uh, for prepping your space. And that's on our YouTube channel to view. All right, so uh, next question from Ryan. Um, he has a couple questions here. What is your favorite butterfly and how much do host plants and nectar plants typically cost? Mm. I, well, when I first started, because it was the first one given to me, it was my, the uh, monarch, but, um, I don't really have a favor. I, I care for them all. Um, I know I've been studying new species of moths and one of my new ones I had last year was the hickory horn devil. And oh, I just love that caterpillar so much. It's gonna be the regal moth when it comes out this year. But um, yeah, I just, I just like them all. Um, you know, in native plants, the smaller you buy them, the less expensive, or even if you want to start them by seed, that would be their cheapest way. You know, so um, it just depends on whether you're going to get seed or you know, what size of plant you're going to buy. Um, you, you know, it doesn't have to be very expensive. Um, and geez, I... I don't know, a couple bucks for a, a plant, you know, on some plants. So, you know, it just depends. We sell at the, for the Native Plant Expo, um, we're selling Designs by Nature and they're four inch pots for 450 and their root systems are really developed. So the nice thing about native plants is, you know, they're already going to thrive in the environment you're putting them in because you're selecting plants that are good for that soil and that climate and are native to that climate. So um, you're going to save a lot of time and uh, resources on uh, cultivating those. 
Okay, another question. And then there's a few tree questions. So I'm gonna uh, put it, uh, lump them together. Um, so uh, Susan wants to know, when do you stump cut? And then we've had a couple people ask what side, what, where do you put your potted plants? Like what side of the house or where do you, where do you store your potted trees? Um, and I'll follow up with another tree question in just a moment. Well, you know, for the winter, they're all on the back, back side of my house. Um, and let's see, that would be the sun comes up in the east. So they're like on the east side of my house. Um, I, you know, just because that's the back of my house. So I, I just put them all there um, for the winter. And, you know, then I'll just move them along my driveway and then it will be, they'll be getting, um, they'll be getting a lot of south, southeast sun then um, along my driveway. But um, yeah, you just having them, uh, you know, against the side of, a, for the winter, against the side of a house or, or your garage or some building will help protect them from the wind. Um, another person asked, uh, do you stump cut, cut your hot tree and your prickly ash? My prickly ash, I haven't yet, but I will when it gets real big. My hot tree I have, and um, I, I cut it really short the one time. And so it, I have a whole bunch of suckers coming up from the right at the base. So really, instead of just one tr trunk coming up now, I have like this beautiful little hot bush. Um, I have a lot more leaves for them to lay their eggs on and feed on. You know, it, it, but it's right next to the main um, trunk. So it's, it's just a nice little bush I have now. Okay. Did you already answer when you stump cut? When do I? Yeah, when. I do it in the fall um, before there's a chance of frost because I want that cut to sill over before frost can get in and, and kill the roots. So I do it in the fall um, before there's a chance of frost. Okay. Um, an another question is uh, Barbara from Plymouth. She's having trouble with viburnum be leaf beetles eating her viburnum bush. So she wants to know what you recommend for that. Well, I was too. And um, so I took off, I went around and squashed tons and tons and tons of larvae. And um, then everything that I've seen them on, I went and cut off my bush and put it in a black plastic bag and tied it up and that went into the trash. And I thought mine was dead and I was gonna dig it up the next year and then it came back really nice. So that's what I did. I know those things are horrible. Um, so the other thing with the viburnum leaf beetles is that they, they laid their eggs um, and the, they do lay eggs in the fall that'll come out next spring. So um, I will have to look up the link, but there's, um, there's photos to show where you can find the egg. So they basically niche out a little spot in the stem. They put like a little fecal matter spit uh, uh, paste over that. And so if you can locate where they've laid their eggs now, you can cut those, cut those out. So at least, come spring, you're not starting with your fresh, fresh batch. You'll still have to um, check for the uh, later, later stages, but um, there's some you can cut out now and you can at least start, start off spring well. Um, okay, so we have another question. Um, can you overwinter the common milkweed that you have in pots? If so, what do you do? I would do the same thing. Um, well, I used to. I used to do that. Um, you know, the ones I had in pots, I used to just move them all together and pack um, leaves and, and mulch in between them and over top of them. Um, but yeah, I used to when I used to have them in pots. Um, <clears throat> so Mary had received information that saving the birds through habitat She's received information that uh, tropical milkweed harms butterflies. Could you comment on that, please? Well, where, where we live in, okay, the, it doesn't really harm 
Oh boy. Um, what she's referring to, if a butterfly has Ophiocystis electroscira, it's an OE parasite. They call it OE for short. If it comes and lands on the tropical milkweed, the spores are on the abdomen of that butterfly and can get on there. And then if a clean butterfly lays the egg, the egg hatches, it will eat it. Um, down south where the tropical milkweed doesn't oh, um, die back, they need to cut theirs down, you know, like in October. Ours, however, dies back, so any OE that's on there would die. Um, there's so much controversy over that. Um, for one thing, tropical milkweed isn't native, but when one of my friends, a professor at U of M, Mark was doing some research and he put the tropical milkweed and the swamp milkweed in a huge area together. It was a big netted area. And he had OE infected adults in there and healthy, clean adults. And the OE infected would lay their eggs on the tropical milkweed. And not on the, um, I, I think it was swamp milkweed. I don't think it was common. Because the card inside of milkweed, there's cardenolides. And the cardenolides um, are what protect the caterpillars from predators because it makes them nauseous if something eats them. Anyways, the caterpillars would feed on the tropical, um, would lay their eggs there and then their caterpillars would feed on that and the what the butterfly was doing was self-medicating her young because those caterpillars feeding on that with the higher cardenolides would actually end up sometimes reversing the OE but being healthier than if they would have laid on the other plant. So this is what Professor Mark Hunter from U of M he did research um, with Jap, on, uh, another professor, Jap, and, on that. And um, that was his conclusion of what was happening. Um, I, would, I would say if you're going to have tropical milkweed in your yard and you collect eggs off of it, if you want to make sure but always existed forever and ever and ever. Um, it's part of nature, it always has. But if you wanna make sure they don't have OE, you can take those eggs and you can put them, and boy, I, I, I haven't done this in years. I can't remember if it's a, I don't think it's a 10% bleach solution. I have the, you can bleach the eggs. And, and if, you, if you go online and go bleach monarch eggs, there's, YouTube um, things and you can put you put them in the solution for a minute you swish them around to get any air bubbles off of them then you rinse them really good then you put them in a paper towel and that will kill any bacteria or parasite that's on that egg and you'll have healthy ones so um, if you're going to have tropical milkweed in your yard and you want to protect them from OE you can bleach the eggs it's perfectly fine um, and it will get rid of it, whether it's that OE parasite or some type of bacteria or anything. So um, yeah, there's just a lot of controversy over the. So that's the advanced the advanced butterfly um, yeah. rearing techniques. There's also a native uh, Sullivan smokeweed that's also high in cardenolides. If you do want to stick to natives and you know have that kind of more medicinal property for the butterflies. So that kind of moves us into some additional questions. And sorry if we don't get to all these questions, I'm gonna to try to group them as much as possible. Um, so Crystal Brown asks, what are you doing with the eggs when you um, 
say you get a bunch of eggs, are you raising them or, and, or just taking photos of them? And then uh, Jeannie Cole also asked, what, how do you propagate the eggs? Well, I do raise them and I raise them and then I release them back out into nature. Um, sometimes I share them with other people um, so that they can learn. And, um, you know, I used to have a lot of kids that came in and to the butterfly house and I give them caterpillars and they would get all excited. So then they'd have their parents plant on um, butterfly gardens, but it's such an educational tool um, so I do like to share some with people so they can raise them too. And, and, but I, I, you know, collect them and I release them back out into nature. Um, I know we, you know, it's food for our songbirds, for all sorts of, you know, dragonflies and frogs and, you know, they need the caterpillars. Excuse me. So the more that I release, there's more food for them. I don't know, but I do like to study them. Um, and I, so I, I collect the eggs, I take pictures, I do journaling of every single bit, um, just so I can learn everything about them, but then I do release them. Um, it's an, oh, and how it's an I, excellent way to learn. And um, when, I, when I first started collecting eggs, I didn't know how gentle to be with them, so I used to rip a little teeny piece of the leaf that they were on and put them in something, and as soon as I seen them hatch, then I would add a fresh leaf now i know so i can just roll them off with my fingers because i know how gentle to do it but if, if you're not experienced i suggest just ripping the little piece of the leaf but make sure as soon as they hatch you give them a fresh leaf so that's the advanced when you can just pull the egg off without tearing the leaf i'm still a leaf tear um kathy would like to know um if the butterfly house will be open at barson's this year barson's nursery in westland michigan well, I gave it to them two years ago. Um, I know for two years they kept it open. So I would imagine they will again this year. You'd have to check with them though, because I just, I got too busy. I'm like, okay, you can have the butterfly house. So I gave it to them. Okay. Okay. So then um, this is another question similar to raising them, uh, Crystal Brown. Uh, had asked if you recommended hand raising them or leaving them in the wild, particularly monarch caterpillars. When you raise them, you want it to be as natural as possible. So I feel it's fine to do it, but you don't want it in a room where they're not going to get natural daylight hours. Um, that throws off their whole metamorph, you know, um, them going into diapause, being more reproductive. So you want them in a room with windows. Um, there's been research where they did it in a closed room and it just threw everything off. And so they wrote a report on that, but that just wasn't even, that wasn't duplicating nature. So you definitely, it, I, you know, you can leave them outside. 1% probably of all eggs laid become adults and the rest are food for everything. Um, you know, your spiders, just all sorts of, um, you know, birds and everything. So you can leave them out. But if you raise them inside, make sure that they have natural daylight hours. You want them in a room with windows. And also another thing, um, okay, just, yeah, make sure it's natural daylight hours. Okay, um, a couple more general questions and then I'll get to some more specific ones. Um, do Michigan butterflies overwinter and fall and leave? Well, I know, um, you know, there's, there's cocoons and there's pupa um, and things like that. Um, I would think question marks and, and Eastern commas and morning cloaks and Milbert's tortoise shells and all of them would probably be more in, you know, in, like I said, in a crevice of a tree or log piles or, you know, um, not just under leaves, but that, that could be, there could be chrysalises under there. There's species over winter as eggs, as caterpillars, as chrysalis, you know, or cocoons or pupa as adults. So under leaves could be any um, 
it could be any um stage of the butterfly or the caterpillar it could be underneath leaves okay um leads us to another kind of similar question Cecropia used to be really common in Chicago in the 70s. Cocoons everywhere in the trees. Why haven't I seen them in 20 years? Well, there could That's be- from Michael. Yeah, you know, um, maybe there's more chemical spraying, um, maybe the area spraying for mosquitoes. Um, you know, I would think there'd be, there wouldn't be that much less habitat, um, you know, because they use a lot of trees, but there could be, you know, um, there could be more buildings going up, um, you know, more, more um, businesses, you know, urban sprawl, um, but, you know, it's really hard to tell. I, usually it's lack of habitat that you don't have the species or the chemical sprays, because a lot of your municipalities are spraying now for mosquitoes and different things, and, and that just kills everything. So, you know, I would I would say it'd have to either be chemicals or lack of habitat would be, you know, the two biggest reasons. Okay. Megan, we're getting close on the time, so I'm gonna try to go through some questions quickly, and then, um, you know, I don't know if the, if the cutoff. Yes, um, I'll, I'm keeping track of time. I was trying to answer some of these questions <laughs> too. <laughs> I'll keep my eye out. Okay. Um, okay, so Tamerlin asks, uh, she has a 20 foot tulip tree that's five feet from her house. Um, so she was thinking that she might need to take it down, but now she's wondering if she can cut it back to two to three feet tall. I mean, it's already 20 feet. Let's see, mine usually gets, Mine was probably about 12. Um, I would try cutting it down to about three feet. I would. Okay, there's another question on trees. Um, somebody has a um, birch and it's getting some suckers at the, at the base. Um, should they cut those off or should they leave them for the caterpillars? Getting what suckers did you say? Suckers at the base of a tree, a birch tree. I'd I'd leave them, but that's just more leaves for them. So you know that that would just be, you know, personal preference. Um, my my tulip tree. Now I have a few suckers coming up there, so I have a beautiful bush tulip tree. Um, you know, but that that's my whole purpose is to have habitat. So, you know, it's personal preference. Do butterfly boxes help butterflies? No, but they sure do help wasp and things. Butterflies don't use them. Wasp and it, they use them. Any native plants that have become problematic for you? I can't think of any. Um, no. <laughs> Do butterflies that lay on arrowwood viburnum lay on any other types of viburnum? Yes, they do. I know they lay, I have a nanaberry too, and they lay on that. Um, you know, those are the only two I have. Um, I'm, and I know that some of my volunteers at the butterfly house, Elmer, he had a different kind and they laid on his and I, I honestly don't remember what kind he had. So there are several different viburnums that they do lay eggs on. <clears throat> if you're planting to improve pollinator presence, what um, butterfly or moth is the pollinating champ? Well, none are as good as bees, but let me tell you, when you plant a butterfly garden, you're gonna have such a diversity of different bees is in your yard. I, I, I've got the coolest bees, I got honeybees, I got all sorts of bees in the yard. Um, you know, butterflies and moths do pollinate, of course, they, you know, they go from one flower to the next. And, and um, I even had a question mark, pollinate my pawpaw tree and I got pawpaw fruit this year. 
or last year. I was so excited. Um, but yeah, um, I would say they're probably all equal because they're all they're all nectarine on flowers. All right. Cindy wants, do you want to ask one more? Um, Cindy wanted to know the definition of a native plant and who is the ultimate authority? <laughs> I actually just, I, I think I missed that one. I had, I'd answered somebody else's. Um, I actually put a link into uh, City of Ann Arbor uh, NAP, their website. They have a nice description of how they define uh, native plants, but typically, you know, uh, it's a, a species that would have been found here before uh, Europeans got here, like in the 1700s. That's kind of the rule of thumb that I tend to follow. What do you guys think? Yeah. So uh, native plants are those that I say haven't come via boat, train, plane, you know, some other type of man-made transportation. So then it's something that wouldn't have uh, gotten here naturally. And so they've been here thousands of years. And then, so this is what these um, butterflies are, 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 have adapted to use yeah, over they, thousands of years or sometimes millions of years in some areas. Yeah, that's a great description. So maybe, you know, it, it'll be interesting as clim climate shifts, um, you know, species move but if you think about it in the context of the timeline there um you know this is like a blip of time uh, in terms of all these introduced species that we've been planting okay so i just want to thank again brenda for being here um and lisa for being here and helping to coordinate the q a um i want to uh Remind you that Brenda will be at the Native Plant Expo and Marketplace. You can get your book signed there. Uh, we will be uh, announcing the winner of the uh, door prize of her book uh, via email tomorrow, which will also include all the resources uh, that Brenda has suggested, as well as some additional resources. Don't forget to grab your Native Plant Expo ticket because although uh, it's free to enter into the Native Plant Expo on June 5th, we are trying to um, manage the amount of people flow uh, due to COVID. So you have to reserve a, a free ticket in a time slot. And you can do that on our website at www.washtenawcd.org. And um, on that day, you can pick up your pre-ordered plants, or we'll have also, I think we have 11 additional vendors selling um, native plants, um, some contractors that can work with you on how to prep your space or problem solve, and then some nonprofits as well uh, on the day of. So it should be a really great event. Um, thank you again, everybody. And uh, We'll also post this on our YouTube site so you can view it later. Do you guys have any other last Sorry comments? if there's any, there's some questions that we weren't able to get to. I'll see if I can go through them and try to um, get those answered. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you again, Brenda. You're welcome. I feel like we could, we could go on for another three hours. <laughs> we'll have to have you back again. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. All right, good night, everybody. Good night.